Hello, my name is Matthew, and in this video, I'm going to model this system that we have to my right, and we'll find how the volume of the liquids in each tank change with time, and how the heights of the liquids in each tank change with time. And so we have the cross-sectional area of this pipe leaving our system given to us. We also know the cross-sectional area between of the pipes between tank one and two. We know the heights of the liquids initially for each tank. And we also know the radii of each tank. And we know that we have an inlet flow entering each tank, but we don't know its value. And so to start off with, to model the changing of the volumes of the liquids, we can say dv1 dt. And it's going to be equal to the flow coming into the tank minus the flow leaving. So flow coming into tank 1 is q in 1 minus the flow leaving tank 1. Q, we'll call it 1, 2. And the changing of the volume of the liquid in tank 2 with respect to time is equal to the flow entering tank 2, which is the inlet and the flow from tank 1. So Q in 2 plus Q1, 2 minus the flow leaving tank 2. And in an initial, initial steady state, we know that the volumes aren't changing. So these are both equal to zero. And we can solve for the flow rates, Q1, 2, and Q2, by deriving Torricelli's law from the Bernoulli equation. So we have P2 minus P1, the difference in pressure between points one and two, divided by the density of our fluid, plus the changing of potential energy points 1 and 2, plus the changing in the kinetic energy from points 1 to 2. And it's equal to the frictional heating plus the non-flow work. We're going to assume that the frictional heating is 0 and we have no non-flow work. So this is equal to 0. Now we can define points 1 and 2, and I've done so over here. And so we have our tank and we have the flow from at point two is being open to the atmosphere, and at point one, it's not. So at point one, sorry, at point two, we can assume that it's zero, and at point one can be measured with a pressure gauge, and so that gets rid of our P2 term. And then we have also modeled it so that the there's no change in heights between point one and two. If you drew a straight line between points one and two, it would be parallel to the surface. And so there's no changing in potential energy. And if you look at the cross-sectional area at point two, it's much smaller than the cross-sectional area at point one. And in a situation like that, the flow or the velocity of the flow at point two is far greater than the velocity of the flow at point one. And the velocity at point one is actually just going to be so, so small that the differences between the two velocities are essentially equal to just the velocity of point two. In other words, the velocity of point one is negligible. And we can also write the pressure at point one as being equal to rho gh. And if we divide by rho, of course, it's just g times h. And so now we have g times h plus the velocity squared over 2 equal to 0. Sorry, that's negative g times h. And solving for the velocity, we get the square root of 2 times g times h. And so Torricelli's equation just gives us the velocity of the fluid given the force of gravity and the height of the fluid. So we can use that to solve for the flow rates between tanks 1 and 2 and leaving tank 2 because the flow is just the cross-sectional area times the velocity of the fluid. And so for the fluid, for the flu flow rate between tanks 1 and 2, you just have cross-sectional area of the pipe between 1 and 2 times the velocity between tanks 1 to 2 and of course, we have a change in height, so we would have Q 
the inlet 1, the flow rate of the inlet 1, minus the flow rate of the the flow rate between tanks 1 and 2, so it would be the cross-sectional area of the pipe between 1 and 2, times the velocity of the flow, so 2 times g, we have a changing of height, so we have the absolute value of the differences and heights between the liquids in tank 1 and 2. And we have a problem with this because this is always going to return a positive value, so we'll always be subtracting this. But in reality, if we had the height of tank 2, or the height of the liquid in tank 2, higher than the height of the liquid in tank 1, the flow would actually go towards tank 1. And this term should be positive. And so what we'll do to model that is we'll just define a function called sine h1 minus h2. And so all that it's going to do is return a positive value if the height of the liquid in, point, or in tank 1 is greater than the height of the liquid in tank 2. And it will return a negative value if the height of the liquid in tank 2 is greater than the height of the liquid in tank 1. And so that way, if the flow is directed this way, we have it correctly modeled in our dvdt term, or equation. And we can substitute that in as well here for q12. So plus a12 cross-sectional area between tanks 1 and 2 times 2g differences between h1 and h2 times the sine function. And then, of course, minus the flow leaving tank 2, which is cross-sectional area of the pipe between our leaving tank 2 times the velocity of that fluid, so 2g times the height of the fluid in tank 2. And so these equations will both model how the volumes of our liquid in each tank change with time. But how can we model how the heights of liquids change with time? Well, to do that, we know we need to find the h dt for each tank. Well, we know that the volume of any shape is equal to its cross-sectional area times its height. And since we have the volume changing, with respect to time, we can also write it like this. And of course, we can then write that as being the cross-sectional area as a function of time times the HDT, or how the height changes with respect to time. And so to solve for dBd, or sorry, dHDT, we can just divide dBdt by some cross-sectional area as a function of time. So, dH dt is equal to dB dt divided by cross-sectional area as a function of time. Well, the cross-sectional area can be written using, we'll just go ahead and draw a diagram of our tank again, and we have some height of the water, and we have it known to us as h, and we have the radius here, we know that it's r, and then we can draw a right angle triangle, And the vertical dimension of our right angle triangle is going to be equal to the difference between the height and the radius, h minus r. And that gives us just that vertical dimension of the triangle. And then this horizontal dimension of our triangle can be written as the radius of the function of time. And we can do that because we know that as the height of the liquid changes, the radius of the cross-sectional area of our liquid is also going to change. So we can write it as a function of time. And so, 
solving for the radius as a function of time, we can use Pythagorean theorem and we'll find that the radius of a function of time is equal to the square root of 2 times the radius of our tank times the height of the liquid in our tank minus the squared height of the liquid in the tank. And so if we want to find the cross-sectional area as a function of time, we know that it is equal to pi, because it's a circle, pi times r squared. r squared in this term changes with time. Our radius is a function of time. And so we can say that it is pi times 2 times the radius of our tank times the height of the liquid minus the squared height of the liquid. And so this is our cross-sectional area as a function of time. All we have to do is divide each of these dvdt terms by their respective cross-sectional areas of function of time, and we'll get how each of their heights change with time. And so if we wanted to find how the heights of tank of the liquid of tank one changes with time, we would get the changing of the volume with respect to time. So Q N1 minus the flow leaving tank one. Sectional area of the pipe between tanks one and two times, we'll go ahead and put the sine function there, times our defined sine function. Times the velocity of the fluid between tanks one and two. And then all of that is divided by is divided by the cross-sectional area as a function of time, which we just defined. So pi times 2 times the radius of our first tank times the height of our tank, of our liquid in tank 1, minus the squared height of the liquid in tank 1. And then if we wanted to find how the radius, or sorry, the height of tank of the liquid in tank 2 changes, dh2 dt, we would simply take this dv2 dt term and divide it by the cross-sectional area once again. So you would get q flow of the inlet for tank 2 plus the flow between tanks 1 and 2. minus the flow leaving tank 2 and once again we're dividing it by the cross-sectional area as a function of time which is pi times the radius I'm sorry 2 times the radius of tank 2 times the height of the liquid in tank 2 minus the squared height of the liquid in tank 2. And so here we have our equations for how the height of the liquid changes in each tank, and we also have equations for how the volume of the liquid in each tank changes. And to find the flow rates Q1, Qn1, and Qn2, we can just set our changing of the volume functions equal to zero, and the only unknown value would be the inlet flow. So assuming they don't change from the steady state approximation or steady state uh, situation, we'd be able to solve for those and not have any unknown values. And so in the next video, I'll go ahead and solve for, or model this all out in collaboratory and use numerical values for the variables we've been given, and we'll actually be able to find numerical values for dh, dt, as well as dv, dt, and 
the inlet flows for tank one and two. Thank you for watching.